whole season. Not to give it away. I've seen the whole season. <laughs> But it meant that the, the, the foundation of the show, the genesis, the genesis of the show, was character. And the supernatural element was added later. I think had I been approached to write a supernatural show, I don't think I would have ended up with being human. I think that, that the process was very long and frustrating. But it meant that the bedrock of the show is character. And consequently, every time we sat down to storyline a new series or even a single episode, we all started from the standpoint of character. And then, you know, then you know, the supernatural element flows from that. So those of you, I'm sure most of you have seen season one, and it very much it does establish, you know, this this camaraderie between the three uh, flatmates. And then in season two, as you probably those of you who saw the, the, the first episode the other night, last night, uh, it, it, it gets things are going to get a little darker. And in fact, I think we have a, a preview that we're going to show you. Is that right? Do we have a clip? Wow. Yeah. Well, you're so lovable. And now, well, you're so lovable. But it gets a little more complicated. Um, so I would love to talk to 
to uh, you know the, the three mains right now about just sort of when you were approached to play these these parts, whether it was as you know, were you told I'm going, you're going to play a ghost, or were you told you're going to play a woman who happens to be a ghost? I mean, how do you sort of order the human versus the monster? And then also, if you can talk a little bit about season two, about this sort of shift in tone, and did you feel like this isn't the show I signed up for at all? And I'm not as lovable as I was. <laughs> uh, yeah, why don't you start that one, Amy? Let's move this mic. I think it's a little bit away. Okay. Well, I'll have an hour. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, in the first year of the <laughs> Yeah, shift, the shift them up this week. Shift well, them up. Is, is that, that's, what was that the one thing they told us not, not to do? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> guy and he's, uh, he's struggling with this addiction um, and he's completely sort of exercised himself from everybody, disassociated himself with everyone who's kind of influenced him in, in, in that way, you know, he's, he's moved from the west of England and he's moved in with the wolf uh, <laughs> and he's decided to, to get himself clean and well you just happen to be there. Um, <laughs> 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 but, um, and he's doing alright, uh, I think, until Harry comes along. Um, and he kind of messes things up a bit, and then it's it's no longer just Mitchell's problem anymore. You know, with George killing Herrick, I think Mitchell feels completely and solely responsible for that. You know, and, and he has to he has to sort of reform his friendships again and the, st the structure in this house that, that he needs and the stability in order for him to get clean and, and to to live this life that he wants to leave now. So the only way of doing that is, um, I guess, is is getting getting darker and, and he needs to step into Herrick's shoes and it's not to rage this holy war and these vampires that he that he kinda knows they're gonna kill his mates and he doesn't do anything about it, but it's, he knows these guys are young and they're vulnerable and, and they're crying out for leadership with Herrick um, being ripped apart and I'm disappearing. Um, <laughs> so he knows he has to do something about that. So so um, but you know the way it works out I mean before he knows what's going on he's uh, He's deep involved with something that he knows he shouldn't be again. He's, everything is a bit too close to home, and, and, uh, and seems to be ripping apart the chocolate here. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so naturally, I guess it just gets darker. It's, it's that progression, and that, that's what we look at the show. That it doesn't. It just it plays itself or something. You know, everything just happens sort of organically. And, and, um, and the dark, I think, the darker the world around us gets, the more we have to work together. Yeah. And you know, everything else outside the house becomes that much more scary and everything inside the house becomes that much more intense and important, I guess. Mm -hmm. So it's not really a choice to get it out, it just sort of happens, you know. And I think more so it's probably Mitch's story than anyone else's really. Yeah, Annie doesn't get dark. Oh, Mitch, she does. She does get the dark on. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm projecting so much on my microphone. Um, season two, everyone kind of goes off a bit more on their own journeys, and I think uh, for Annie, that's that's very lonely because these guys um, are the only ones that really can see her and acknowledge her. So when they go off and be vampire -y and morphy, <laughs> she's like bored. <laughs> I think she gets frustrated and she gets to um, kind of she gets hit with the reality stick of not moving on and being stuck um, and all the things that she's going to be missing out on but able to witness and other people like families and love and relationships and growing old and all of that stuff and it's frankly um, her so she has some tough tough decisions to make um, but they do come back to the house sometimes just not enough <laughs> yeah yeah and it goes um hi everyone it goes um, <laughs> It goes, uh, it, goes, yeah, it goes dark for George. Um, his biggest fear is uh, embracing the wolf within him and killing someone. And the end of the first season, he's used the wolf within him to kill someone. Yes, it's Eric who's a vampire, but um, he's done it. And unbeknownst to him, he's scratched the love of his life, the only person who he's really, really connected to. 
and uh, he's got. Was <laughs> she doing that at him? <laughs> how, how many people here have seen all the first season? Because it's Sinead's like it's my first, first time. time. She's a, she's a virgin. Yeah. Uh, she's got a chance to see rings on. Oh. And um, she uh, she was saying I was, I was saying to her, you know everyone's gonna watch this. When they're not, I said, I promise you they will. They will illegally download it and be proud of me. I know I'm proud of you for doing it. There was the same George Dark, yeah. He, turns, he just turns into a, he's got too much testosterone suddenly. And uh, George being a sensitive soul, um, he can't really handle it, he doesn't really know what to do with it. And uh, that takes him on a very strange tangent and he kind of acts out in various ways. Um, Usually other vampires. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, doing various things with various people. <laughs> <laughs> your, your question was, um, that when we first heard about it, can you remember that? No. <laughs> when you, when, I just want to say piracy hurts us all, people. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you were saying when we first heard about it, what did we think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you yeah. thought of yourself first as playing a werewolf, yeah. first as playing, like, I mean, I mean, George, the character of George has the biggest split in between the personalities because mm. he really is, you know, the, like, sweet boy faced, you know, yeah. Meet around the house and then Writing the second season, what are you? The, 
the characters seem to come, the first season it was more like about them, their humanity that was tinged with these various curses. And in the second season, they are doing very real battle with the monsters within them. And so what, what are you thinking? I mean, what is the journey here that you're trying to take them on? Um, the thing that I guess that, I guess that the journey uh, evolves and changes. Uh, um, there, I mean, there was, never, there was never a conscious decision to make the second series darker. Uh, it was just, it just felt like a very natural evolution of the show. I think that um, the characters have to progress and they have to move on. And in a way, we, you can't spend, we couldn't have spent the second series with the characters in a state of denial about what they are. They have to embrace it, they have to move forward. But by doing that, that takes them into, into other areas, that takes them into other stories. The ambition of the show has always been, bizarrely, given the preposterous nature of the, the, the format, but the ambition has always been to do as realistic a show as possible. And uh, in a way, the kind of task that we set ourselves is that if these creatures really existed, what would their lives be like? And so uh, when we sit down in the storyline, we have to talk about it in very logical terms. I mean, look at the, the sort of infrastructure of the vampire world. Um, we had to approach that very logically. And we had to think about, well, you know, they would specifically have put people in different strata of society. They would have people placed in the police force just as a kind of insurance for, you know, to, because their, their sort of prime objective is to remain secret. And um, and so as I say, I think that you know that, um, when we start when we sat down the storyline the second series, it just felt like a very natural evolution that, that these stories would get darker. I mean, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna tell if you're gonna tell stories about vampires and werewolves and ghosts, that is going to take you into very dark territory. That's going to, those characters are then going to be you know put at risk and find themselves in in, in situations of jeopardy. And um, and as I say, that it, it purely came out of a, out of a, out of a realistic as possible. You know, um, when we talk about vampires and, and werewolves, and this has become a big, you know, big issue in popular culture over here, and, and often they're used as, as symbols for, or the, in the press, we like to talk about them as symbols, uh, you know, uh, for everything from addiction to uh, gay marriage to, you know, just like a, that you can deal with a lot of otherness, you know, a lot of issues of otherness by, by making people literally other. Is that something that you're thinking? And then I would like to ask the cast if that's something that you think about when you when you're uh, you know coming to your roles in terms of you know is it just uh, what it must be like for people who see themselves as other as a part of society? I think that I think that everyone uh, I think part of the human condition is, is occasional feelings of isolation and disenfranchisement. I think that uh, there's something about the characters that everyone can relate to. I don't think. You, I think that, in a way, that the fact that they're supernatural creatures is almost kind of by the by. I think that, I think that as human beings, we all feel the same sense of, of loneliness and uh, uh, seclusion that, that I think they feel. And so that means that the, the storylining always becomes very easy. We never set out to tell supernatural stories. The ambition and, and, the, and you know, we try and always tell very human stories that just have a supernatural side. Yeah, yeah, the show isn't like a celebration of the supernatural side, is it? It's about these guys trying to be human. I think that's why so many people connect to it, because we're all human, aren't we, really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. I mean, you can't, you can't sort of, maybe I'm speaking for all of us, you, you, you can't play the supernatural. I don't know how you do that, but it's, it's almost impossible. Um, certainly to get your, your head around it, the psyche around it, and Mitchell being, uh, being, being an addict is, is enough to know. I mean, the fact that it's blood, it could be anything. And, and um, so it doesn't really change that, you know. You just you have to play what you know and the reality of the situation. And that's enough to kind of propel it into its own, um, to, to give it its, its understanding and its own meaning. So I don't, uh, it's never something that entered my head, you know, how am I going to choose the beauty of the show, I think, is as we were saying, as we're all kind of saying, is that the cross that each one of the characters has to bear, you know, the fact that one's a vampire, one's a ghost, and now two werewolves, is, is incidental, really. It's secondary. It's it's about how they all kind of deal with with with, with life day to day and you know, just trying to get by really. And, and, you know, as, as far under the radar as possible. 
you know, they don't want to stick their head in the power because they just want a nice, normal, humdrum, peaceful existence, <laughs> which is what they don't get. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's all, it's all incidental. I think as well as the, um, the feelings. Uh, well, I know for Annie, I always go to the feelings. So, you know, the idea that nobody can see her, I just try and, how would that feel? Um, I mean, I know I've gone into a room before and just felt a bit invisible or a bit, a bit out of place. Or, you know, there's been times in my life where I feel like I'm not really taking part, I'm just watching, and everyone else seems to be getting on with things really, really well, and everyone else feels really, really sorted. and. And so all those things that, the implications of being invisible, the implications of being stuck or not knowing what's next or how to be or finding your self-worth in, in other people, being in denial about the men you're with, hell yeah. <laughs> I, mean, like, I know what Annie is going through. And, um, you know, we've stuck in the same outfit for ages. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what, to be honest, it's, it's actually quite nice because I put on that costume and I'm like halfway there to that stupid much. <laughs> like, um, they just buy it. Um, no, it, 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 it has become such a part of her now. And it, it, it's, it's, it is all part of the frustration of being Annie. It's as much as she's got a very positive attitude and a positive outlook on life, sometimes blindly positive, um, she, you know, she's stuck. Um, and it's but this season seems to be about her getting, or at least towards the end, that she is finding her strength. And it's yeah. like, I realized at the end, you know, she actually, out of all of them, you can't be hurt by anyone. You know, I mean, George and well, her feet, Mitchell can actually, feet, yeah. yeah, but I mean, you can physically, you know, do things that they can't do because they can't kill you because you're already dead. Yeah. But, you know, and it's like, when is she going to realize that? Like, like you know. There's a huge power that. in that. Absolutely, and that, that's another lovely thing about it. She's got <laughs>
for the American remake, if you could change anything about your character, what would be and why for the American His name, I wouldn't call him Aiden. It's <laughs> <really true. laughs> um, what would we change? Um, I wouldn't give him so much money. <laughs> Not that we're complaining. No, no, we do. 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 Yeah, that's my input. Enjoy. I think Annie should have straight hair and not wear grey. <laughs> that's my thing. If she pulls off curly hair and it's grey, but then I do it. <laughs> yeah. That's all you've got. <laughs> You? I just said it by name. Rubbish, rubbish name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You mentioned the, the three main characters and the neurosis that you wrote before you then turned them into supernaturals. So now that we brought Nina on board, what is her neurosis? She's the fourth member of ABBA. Toby's doing a Beyonce review as well. So if you want to catch that, it's hot. So you can answer, then you just have to answer. Yeah, uh, I'd say that um, I think that Nina's choice of men is particularly good. Um, <laughs> so she's the first one who uh, gave her scars, and the second one gave, gave her scars. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know, I'm really. Um, let me have a think about it, and then next year's Comic Con. <laughs> okay, um, my question's kind of obscure, and if you haven't watched the show, you won't get it. Um, the third episode, there's a, ha a house meeting, and Russell's question is mostly for you. Um, your character talks about you went paintballing, and you're never going to do it again. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you came up yourself with why exactly George didn't ever want to go paintballing ever again? I think he was bullied by all his paintballing friends and they just sort of cornered him and pummeled him with paint. <laughs> and they left him. They stripped him first, then pummeled him. <laughs> That's what I expect, yeah. Oh, uh, and everything, I mean everything got pummeled serious. <laughs> the paint was immense. I mean, worst of transformation. Thank you. You're welcome. And Yeah, the characters of being human seem to change, which is really 
nice. As an actor, that's something you can run with. Um, I don't think any of our characters are the same as when you first met them. Like, certainly not by season three. It's like you've gone on a journey, you're different. I mean, in essence, you're obviously the same person, but you know, as in real life, you grow and change and develop relationships, change and develop and shift and whatnot. And, and Toby writes characters that are changing. So I suppose you, you take it and come up with it. Yeah, well, it just naturally evolves. It, it does it itself. It's easy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey guys, how's it going? Um, yeah, yeah. I just want to congratulate you on making such a, a deep and meaningful show. I find myself relating to it, uh, and it's a supernatural show, which is confusing. So I, just, I think it's amazing. And uh, Lenora, you're even more beautiful in person, maybe because you're not dead in real life. <laughs> My question is actually about Annie. Um, I total nerds, so I like the supernatural part of the show, and I'm wondering, um, I know it's you know, about deeper human issues, but are you guys going to go more into Annie's afterlife? I was really intrigued by what was on the other side of the door. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, season two, definitely. Um, I really yeah. like to think that when she turned down there, because Harry banged on the door and all that, um, interrupted. Um, I think she would like to think that's it and that's over because even though she knew it was her door and it was quite serene and she's ready to go through, she's got something to stay for now in, in the house and, and the boys and everything. So I think secretly she's really quite chuffed that she missed that bus. Um, but she doesn't know what, what it means and I think she'd love to just mean it's over now but season two says otherwise. You don't just not get on that bus. That bus is being driven by death. <laughs> and death attacks so inevitable. So I think um, it chases her down in, in season two and it really does terrify her because she doesn't know what's beyond the door. I think she, she, she has a couple of ideas but then she fills in the blanks and it's, it's not good in her head and she doesn't want to go. Um, and it, yeah, it gets scarier and scarier and scarier. And um, yeah, so it's definitely something that explores in season two. But for those of you who see it, yeah, it doesn't catch up with her. You can't just walk away from the door. That's really cool. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thank you. Hi. Um, uh, was the audition process for Kemp, uh, did that involve having all the actors read from the Bible and counting how many people had fled in terror by the end? <laughs> um, so this, uh, um, but Kemp, that, uh, what happened with uh, I just knew of uh, Donald Trump. I kind of broke that part for the actor. Uh, I hadn't met him, but I kind of knew his work on TV and theatre, and I just thought, he looks really creepy, <laughs> and, uh, and so we put him in that little bit that in the end of at the end of season one, and um, it was just a kind of a triumph. We didn't get him to read because you know there are sort of levels of actors that you just don't get to read to make it on, and uh, we kind of got you know we got him in for that last bit, and he just nailed it. And but at that stage, I didn't really know what the character was, and so I think I was kind of led by him and just the kind of the, the weird sort of neatness. His performance, and uh, and so then having you know him in, in place, then writing the second series for him was was, was very easy with, with him in mind. But I mean, in, in real life, he's he's an absolute delight. But yeah, he's really creepy. Yes. <laughs> he's a lovely man. Very nice. We are we are all a little bit scared. <laughs> My real question actually was uh, uh, for Toby and uh, Aiden. Um, one thing I didn't really like in season two was... Uh, um, spoilers! Spoilers! Uh, spoilers. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, somebody put your mic up there. <laughs> um, I, I, I was mentioning kind of using the women in his life as kind of an emotional crush. Almost in a creepy emotional blackmail kind of way. Mm -hmm. like, <laughs> So, um, so how much of that um, um, uh, was intentional? How much of it is because Mitch is many years old? How yeah. much of it? Yeah, I, mean, I think Mitch uses a lot of people as a crutch. You know, he needs he needs he needs this form and stability at this point in time. You know, he, he can't he can't trust himself. You know, and, and he's he's had these problems for so long and, and these issues, but he's uh, he's rattled all the time. I think he goes through he's ebbs and flows all the time. He, feels all right, so like any addict, and, and he's dealing with it, and then suddenly something happens in his life, and everything is turned around again. And I think unknowingly, he probably does rest on 
on <clears throat> some people and, and sort of take advantage a little bit. But I, I don't know, I, I think everyone does that in times of need and stuff. And it's not always a negative thing. Um, and that's when you have brilliant friends around. Um, they kind of sort it out. And um, so I don't know, I, it's not, I don't see it as a bad thing, you know. I think to be fair, as I said, the, the, you know, the intention is to do as realistic a show as possible. And, and men have men rubbish. Do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, that, that part of it, I think, is really great because that is, that's a theme that runs through all of this vampire bit because there's always the, you know, the poor vampire and then the woman who's going to save him. And in this one, at least, it's a little more naked. That, you know, it's not an equitable relationship. You know? Good question. Okay, so my name is Mr. Toby. So you talk a lot about the series, like the importance that the the supernatural people have, like place themselves in different parts of society. So how did you choose to have all the characters, well, pretty much all the characters of the family, can't believe, um, work in the hospital? I mean, besides the blood issue, but I mean, I thought it was really interesting that you put them all together and yeah, um, no, that, again, that was, that was because um, we wanted to do, we wanted, you know, we thought, okay, if these, if these creatures really existed, what would their lives be like? And it struck me that they would be wanting to live under the radar. They would want to be as anonymous as possible. And so they have deliberately taken these kind of ancillary jobs because they're, they're very low profile. They're, you know, it's, very, it's very easy when you live on the, the fringe of society just to disappear. And, uh, and uh, you, know, you know, if they become head of ICI or something, then, you know, that, that would, that would uh, expose them too much and, uh, and they would put their, their secrets at risk. And so it, it, was a, it was a very logical decision that if you want to hide, you're going to hide you know, somewhere, you know, doing, you know, rather kind of low-level jobs, something like that, that's the best place to, that's the best place to be anonymous, really. And also, um, uh, it, also, the thing about hospitals is that it is a real, it's where um, life and death mix on a very, you know, obviously on a daily basis. And I think, you know, and so I think for the show, that's a very good, evocative mix. Thank you. I'm studying, I'm studying to be an actress, and I was wondering, um, I just want to say that I really admire all the actors work on the show. Like, I really look up to you guys as actors, you guys are my role models. And um, I was wondering, what was the most emotionally challenging scene you had to work on in the show? Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll jump on it. Um, I think that scene that you saw in that clip was, that was, well, for me anyway, was, was the most emotionally difficult. <laughs> and there's a scene in this second episode. Third, second episode where I leave at the door with you. Yes. That was a bit. Mm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, but then when she gets back, she gets a bit, you know, she gets, um, she gets a mojo back. She's a bit kick ass in the end, but at the beginning, thank you. Uh, <laughs> they were my emotional bits. Mm. I don't know, there's loads. There's that scene which reminds me with uh, myself and George, Mitchell and George, at the end of episode 8 of the second series in the corridor when uh, Mitchell is just completely losing his mind and he has camp and everything, his whole world is just falling around him um, and he's lost, they've lost Andy and he feels like he's, he's back on the wagon again and everything is just, it's just yeah, falling around him and then, and then George kind of brings him back um, and that was, that was pretty full on I remember but there's so many, I mean, that's the great thing about this show and, and it's, it's really for an actor to be in a show like this, because there's just so much scope. You get a chance to play everything, uh, almost in every context. You know, it's it's um, it's like the best uh, drama school in the world. <laughs> also, we go on. I mean, we, there's a lot of emotional moments we have to kind of achieve, and I think we get on so well as actors that you kind of get to a point because we've been together so long that when you do have to cry. The other actor has the ability to give you whatever you need to feel that emotion, and that's kind of what's a blessing with this. Really, is that you know I, I have to cry a hell of a lot more than this. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, I keep talking about it too much. But you know, um, that's what we kind of is brilliant in this show that we uh, we really give that to each other and that's great. Yeah, I think we make it kind of real for each other as well. I know that, I think one of the most emotional scenes I've done, and he's very emotional as well, is that George. Yeah, um, yeah it doesn't get naked. I don't get naked. <laughs> 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 At all. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, okay. <laughs>
Russell like, said, do you want to do this scene? I was like, yeah, of course I want to come back. And I didn't really think anything of it. Because to be honest with you, I've never really watched Torchwood. I know of it, but I've never watched it. Sat for it. Sorry. <laughs> but, he, I did that scene, and then after it came out, I'm just bombarded with messages and people saying, oh, you're going to be Jack's lover. And, <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know. It would be fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> two years in a row to come here to promote the show, whether we've watched it legally, illegally, <laughs> uh, do you guys feel like you're in direct competition now with the remake? No. Uh, it's a whole different beast. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and how do you feel about the fact that there's a remake after two series? It's great. It's quite weird if we were here at Comic Con, we were here still, and they were here to handle so that would be quite
It's all going so beautiful. Yeah. Did somebody call my agent and ask you? Hi. Changes you made from the original original pilot that we did in the screen over here at all. I don't know if you want to influence those because it, you kind of remade some of it and some of the events kind of happened afterwards, but it's been happening for a really long time. So. <laughs> uh, the original pilot, um, in, I don't know. I don't know what they're in terms of the American version. I don't know what they're going to do. That's that's entirely up to them. Um, when we did the pilot in the UK, actually what was really beneficial about it, we did exactly what you're meant to do with pilots in as much as we, uh, you know, we had the episode and we looked at it. And it gave us the opportunity to look at certain aspects of it and think, okay, that's great, yes, we like that, that doesn't work. And the thing that I felt that didn't work about the pilot um, uh, was the thing that didn't work about the pilot was the banner fights. Because um, I think in every, you know, like I said, we've always tried to make the show as realistic as possible. But in the pilot, the one thing I felt we, that was skewed a bit wrong was the vampires. That it's like Mitchell had kind of suddenly walked into a different show. The vampires in the pilot were very kind of Van Rice. It was all kind of lace and frills and... <laughs> and, uh, it's just, and it just was inconsistent. It just didn't, wasn't consistent with the rest of the show. So that gave us the opportunity to, to readdress that. Um, and, you know, that, you know, and also, the, you know, the cast we had in the pilot were fantastic, but, you know, we wanted to make some adjustments there. And there was no comment on them as it's performance, but, again, we wanted to take the show in, in, in a different direction. And it was funny because the, the, the pilot in the UK was very successful, and, um, it, you know, there was a campaign to, to get the show commissioned. Uh, what effect that actually had on this commissioning, I don't know. But um, it meant that when we... When we started, when the, the new cast was announced, it was kind of met with these howls of horror. That um, uh, because I think the, the audience felt like kind of shareholders in the show. Um, but of course, then they saw the new cast and uh, and saw how extraordinary they were when they all show up. And uh, <laughs> uh, 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 the pilot um, gave us the opportunity to refine the show. And I think without, if we'd gone straight into a series, I don't think. I don't think we. I don't think the show would be as good. Uh, so I'm very pleased that they had the opportunity to do the pilot. So it was just that you kind of left like Annie got actually introduced in the first pilot, and she kind of just existed in the second version of the pilot. Yeah. Is there a kind of reason that you want to introduce the character again? Uh, I think to be honest, it's a. Um, it's, it's really, really dull. I'm sorry. I think um, because of the way that the BBC funds itself, the way the BBC is funded. It would have meant that we had to have filmed the same script twice, and I think that was possibly rightly considered a waste of public money. So actually, rather than just do the same script again, we just wanted to carry on and keep that forward momentum. Um, and uh, you know, rather than kind of go back and just you know set up exactly the same show. Exactly it was transmitted as well, wasn't it? That's so, the thing, because yeah, because the pilots in the US don't get transmitted, but the pilot in the UK does get transmitted, and so meant that the audience had already seen it. So we would have been kind of just trading water for that first episode. Um, I'm sorry, I'm happy and happy to be here. It's the end. <laughs>